Hello, and welcome to A Sound Constitution here on CHLY 101.7 FM, a show where we focus on health topics important to our community. This year's team is made up of eight third-year VIU nursing students. Our goal is to demystify health issues and address common misconceptions by sharing evidence-informed information from a variety of reliable resources. All information provided on our show will be available in our show notes on our Facebook and Instagram pages. We want to remind our listeners that the information presented in this show is for educational purposes only and does not replace the advice of your primary healthcare professional. If you have any questions or concerns about what's being discussed, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook at A Sound Constitution, Instagram at CHLY A Sound Constitution, all one word, Twitter at ASC underscore VIU, or email us at asoundconstitution at gmail.com. We would like to start our show by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Sinemo people, with a broadcasting range that overlaps the Kiwatsan and Sly Amen territories. This acknowledgement is done with gratitude to the Sinemo people and with the intention to increase awareness about truth and reconciliation processes and efforts on Vancouver Island. Additional information and resources surrounding Sinemo history, reconciliation, protocol, and land acknowledgement can be found on our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube pages. Hi, I'm Cedric, your host for today, and I am joined with my co-hosts Stella, Lara, and Shan. In this episode, we will be focusing on addiction. We will talk about some of the factors behind addiction, the role of adverse childhood experiences in the development of addiction, and some statistics regarding deaths due to illicit drug toxicity in BC. Later in the show, I will sit down with Janice Michelli, a counselor here in Nanaimo, to discuss some important questions regarding addiction. I would like to start this episode by giving a quick definition of addiction. Gabor Mate, a physician who is one of the world's most revered thinkers on the psychology of addiction, defines addiction as, and I quote, any repeated behavior, substance related or not, in which a person feels compelled to persist, regardless of its negative impact on his life and the lives of others. Now that I've defined addiction, what causes addiction in the first place? I will now play a TED talk by Johan Hari, a journalist who has extensively researched addiction and some of the factors behind it. One of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to. And I was just a little kid, so I didn't really understand why. But as I got older, I realized we had drug addiction in my family, including later cocaine addiction. I've been thinking about it a lot lately, partly because it's now exactly 100 years since drugs were first banned in the United States and Britain, and we then imposed that on the rest of the world. It's a century since we made this really fateful decision to take addicts and punish them and make them suffer because we believed that would deter them, it would give them an incentive to stop. And a few years ago, I was looking at some of the addicts in my life who I love and trying to figure out if there was some way to help them. And I realized there were loads of incredibly basic questions I just didn't know the answer to. Like, what really causes addiction? Uh, Why do we carry on with this approach that doesn't seem to be working? And is there a better way out there that we could try instead? So I read loads of stuff about it, and I couldn't really find the answers I was looking for. So I thought, okay, I'll go and sit with different people around the world who've lived this and studied this and talk to them and see if I can learn from them. And I ended up, I didn't realize I would end up going over 30,000 miles at the start, but I ended up going and meeting loads of different people from a transgender crack dealer in Brownsville, Brooklyn, to a scientist who spends a lot of time feeding hallucinogens to mongooses to see if they like them. Um, It turns out they do, but only in very specific circumstances. To to the only country that's ever decriminalized all drugs, from cannabis to crack, Portugal. And the thing I realized that really blew my mind is almost everything we think we know about addiction is wrong. And if we start to absorb the new evidence about addiction, I think we're going to have to change a lot more than our drug policies. But let's start with what we think we know, what I thought I know, right? Let's think about this middle row here, right? Imagine all of you, for 20 days now, went off and used heroin three times a day. Some of you look a little bit more enthusiastic than others at this prospect. Um, the, don't worry, it's just a thought experiment. Imagine you did that, right? What, do we, what would happen? Now, we have a story about what would happen that we've been told for a century. We think, because there are chemical hooks in heroin, as you took it for a while, your body would become dependent on those hooks, you'd start to physically need them, and at the end of those 20 days, you'd all be heroin addicts, right? That's what I thought. First thing that alerted me to the fact something not right with this story 
So when it's explained to me, if I step out of this TED Talk today and I get hit by a car and I break my hip, I'll be taken to hospital and I'll be given loads of diamorphine. Diamorphine is heroin. It's actually much better heroin than you're ever going to buy on the streets because the stuff you buy from a drug dealer is contaminated, actually very little of it is heroin, whereas the stuff you get from the doctor is medically pure. And you'll be given it for quite a long period of time. There are loads of people in this room who may not realize that you've taken quite a lot of heroin, right? And, and, for, and anyone watching this anywhere in the world, this is happening. And if what we believe about addiction is right, those people are exposed to all those chemical hooks. What should happen? They should become addicts. This has been studied really carefully. It doesn't happen. You will have noticed if your grandmother had a hip replacement, she didn't come out as a junkie. <laughs> and when I learned this, it just seems so weird to me, so contrary to everything I've been told, everything I thought I knew, I just thought it couldn't be right. Until I went and met a man called Bruce Alexander, who's a professor of psychology in Vancouver, who carried out an incredible experiment that I think really helps us to understand this issue. Professor Alexander explained to me, the idea of addiction we've all got in our heads, that story, comes partly from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They're really simple experiments. You can do them tonight when you go home if you feel a little bit sadistic. You get a rat and you put it in a cage and you give it two water bottles. One is just water and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself quite quickly. So there you go, right? That's how we think it works. In the 70s, Professor Alexander comes along and he looks at this experiment and he noticed something. He said, ah, we're putting the rat in an empty cage. It's got nothing to do except use these drugs. Let's try something a bit different. So Professor Alexander built a cage that he called Rat Park, which is basically heaven for rats, right? They've got loads of cheese, they've got loads of colored balls, they've got loads of tunnels. Crucially, they've got loads of friends, they can have loads of sex, and they've got both the water bottles, the normal water and the drugged water. But here's the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water. They almost never use it. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. You go from almost 100% overdose when they're isolated to 0% overdose when they have happy and connected lives. Now, when he first saw this, Professor Alexander thought, you know, maybe this is just a thing about rats. They're quite different to us. You know, not, maybe not as different as we'd like, but, you know... Um, but fortunately, there was a human experiment into the exact same principle happening at the exact same time. It was called the Vietnam War. In Vietnam, 20% of all American troops were using loads of heroin. And uh, if you look at the news reports from the time, they were really worried because they thought, my God, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of junkies on the streets of the United States when the war ends. It made total sense. Now, those soldiers who were using loads of heroin were followed home. The archives of general psychiatry did a really detailed study. And what happened to them? It turns out they didn't go to rehab. They didn't go into withdrawal. 95% of them just stopped. Now, if you believe the story about chemical hooks, that makes absolutely no sense. But Professor Alexander began to think there might be a different story about addiction. He said, what if addiction isn't about your chemical hooks? What if addiction is about your cage? What if addiction is an adaptation to your environment. Looking at this, there was another professor called Peter Cohen in the Netherlands who said, maybe we shouldn't even call it addiction. Maybe we should call it bonding. Human beings have a natural and innate need to bond. And when we're happy and healthy, we'll bond and connect with each other. But if you can't do that because you're traumatized or isolated or beaten down by life, you will bond with something that will give you some sense of relief. Now, that might be gambling, that might be pornography, that might be cocaine, that might be cannabis, but you will bond and connect with something because that's our nature. That's what we want as human beings. And I think, you know, at first I found this quite a difficult thing to get my head around, but one way to help me to think about it is, and I can see, you know, I've got over by my seat there a bottle of water, right? I'm looking at lots of you, and lots of you have bottles of water with you, right? Forget drugs, forget the drug war. Totally legally, all of those bottles of water could be bottles of vodka, right? We could all be getting drunk, I might, after this. Um, and, but we're not, right? Now, because you've been able to afford the approximately a gazillion pounds that it costs to get into a TED Talk, I'm guessing you guys could afford to be drinking vodka for the next six months. You wouldn't end up homeless. You're not going to do that. And the reason you're not going to do that is not because anyone's stopping you. It's because you've got bonds and connections that you want to be present for. You've got work you love. You've got people you love. You've got healthy relationships. And a core part of addiction, 
I came to think, and I believe the evidence suggests, is about not being able to bear to be present in your life. Now, this has really significant implications. The most obvious implications are for the war on drugs, right? In Arizona, I went out with a group of women who were made to wear T-shirts saying I was a drug addict and go out on chain gangs and dig graves while members of the public could jeer at them. And when those women get out of prison, they're going to have criminal records that mean they'll never work in the legal economy again. Now, that's a very extreme example, obviously, in the case of the chain gang. But actually, almost everywhere in the world, we treat addicts to some degree like that. We punish them, we shame them, we give them criminal records, we put barriers between them reconnecting. And there was a doctor in Canada, uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, an amazing man, who said to me, if you wanted to design a system that would make addiction worse, you would design that system. Now, there's a place that decided to do the exact opposite, and I went there to see how it worked. In the year 2000, Portugal had one of the worst drug problems in Europe. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin, which is kind of mind-blowing. And every year, they tried the American way more and more. They punished people and stigmatized them and shamed them more. And every year, the problem got worse. And one day, the prime minister and the leader of the opposition got together and basically said, look, we can't go on with a country where we're having ever more people becoming heroin addicts. Let's set up a panel of scientists and doctors to figure out what would genuinely solve the problem. And they set up a panel led by an amazing man called Dr. Huang Gulao to look at all this new evidence. And they came back and they said, decriminalize all drugs from cannabis to crack. But, and this is the crucial next step, take all the money we used to spend on cutting addicts off, on disconnecting them, and spend it instead on reconnecting them with the society. And that's not, it's interesting, that's not really what we think of. What they did wasn't really what we think of as drug treatment in the United States and Britain. So they do do residential rehab, they do do psychological therapy that does have some value. But the biggest thing they did was the complete opposite of what we do. A massive program of job creation for addicts and micro loans for addicts to set up small businesses. So say you used to be a mechanic. When you're ready, they go to a garage and they'll say, if you employ this guy for a year, we'll pay half his wages. The goal was to make sure that every addict in Portugal had something to get out of bed for in the morning. And when I went and met the addicts in Portugal, it's fascinating, what they said is, as they rediscovered purpose, they rediscovered bonds and relationships with the wider society. It'll be uh, 15 years this year since that experiment began, and the results are in. Injecting drug use is down in Portugal, according to the British Journal of Criminology, by 50%, 50%. Overdose is massively down, HIV is massively down among addicts, uh, addiction in every study is significantly down. One of the ways you know it's worked so well is that almost nobody in Portugal wants to go back to the old system. Now that's the kind of political implications. I actually think there's a layer of implications to all this research below that. You know, we live in a culture where people feel really increasingly vulnerable to all sorts of addictions, whether it's to their smartphones or to shopping or to eating. You know, before these talks began, you guys know this, that uh, we were told we weren't allowed to have our smartphones on. And I have to say, a lot of you looked an awful lot like addicts who were being told their dealer was going to be unavailable for the next couple of hours. And, you know, a lot of us feel like that. And it might sound weird to say, oh, you know, I've been talking about how disconnection is a major driver of addiction. But weird to say it's growing because you think, well, we're the most connected society there's ever been, surely. But I increasingly began to think that the connection we have, the connections we have, we think we have, are like a kind of parody of human connection. If you have a crisis in your life, you'll notice something. It won't be your Twitter followers who come to sit with you. It won't be your Facebook friends who help you turn it around. It'll be your flesh and blood friends who you have deep and nuanced and textured face-to-face -face relationships with. And... I think there's a, there's a study I learned about from Bill McKibben, the environmental writer, I think tells us a lot about this. There's a, it looked at the number of close friends the average American believes they can call on in a crisis. That number has been declining steadily since the 1950s. The amount of floor space an individual has in their home has been steadily increasing. And I think that's like a metaphor for the choice we've made as a culture, right? We've traded floor space for friends. We've traded stuff for connections. And the result is that we are one of the loneliest societies there has ever been. And yet Bruce Alexander, the guy who did the Rat Park experiment, says, we talk all the time in addiction about individual recovery. And it's right to talk about that. But we need to talk much more about social recovery. Something's gone wrong with us, not just as individuals, but as a group. And we created a society where, for a lot of us, life looks a whole lot more like that isolated cage and a whole lot less like Rat Park. If I'm honest, this isn't why I went into it, right? I didn't go in to discover the political stuff, the social stuff. I wanted to know how to help the people I love. And when I came back from this long journey and I'd learned all this, I looked at the addicts in my life, and if, 
you know, if you're really candid, it's, it's hard loving an addict, and there's going to be lots of people who know in this room you're angry a lot of the time. And um, I think one of the reasons why this debate is so charged is because it runs through the heart of each of us, right? Everyone has a bit of them that looks at an addict and thinks, I wish someone would just stop you. And the kind of script we're told for how to deal with the addicts in our lives is typified by, I think, by the reality show Intervention. If you guys haven't seen it, I think everything in our lives is typified by reality TV, but that's another, that's another TED talk. Um, uh, if you've never seen the show Intervention, it's a pretty simple premise. You get an addict, all the people in their life, gather them together and say, if you don't shape up, confront them with what they're doing, and they say, if you don't shape up, we're going to cut you off, right? So what they do is they take the connection to the addict and they threaten it. They make it contingent on the addict behaving the way they want. Um, and I began to think, I began to see why that approach doesn't work. And I began to think that almost that's like the importing of the logic of the drug war into our private lives. So I was thinking, well, how could I be Portuguese, right? And what I try to do now, and I can't tell you I do it consistently and I can't tell you it's easy, is to say to the addicts in my life that I want to deepen the connection with them, to say to them, I love you whether you're using or you're not. I love you whatever state you're in. And if you need me, I'll come and sit with you because I love you and I don't want you to be alone or to feel alone. And I think the core of that message, you're not alone, we love you, has to be at every level of how we respond to addicts, socially, politically, and individually. For a hundred years now, we've been singing war songs about addicts. I think all along we should have been singing love songs to them because the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. Thank you. And once again, this was Johan Hari on the causes of addiction. Hello. It's time to take a break and dive into a segment that's all about harm reduction. Harm reduction is defined by Health Canada as an evidence-based public health approach that aims to reduce the negative health, social, and economic impacts of substance use-related harm without requiring or promoting abstinence. Harm reduction strategies for addiction in Canada began to gain recognition and implementation in the late 1980s. The concept of harm reduction emerged as a response to the HIV and AIDS epidemic which disproportionately affected those individuals who inject drugs. Harm reduction initiatives such as needle exchange programs were established in various cities in Canada during that time to provide clean needles and syringes for injecting drugs, aiming to prevent the spread of bloodborne infections. However, this progress was stalled in 2007 when the federal government removed harm reduction and increased the drug policy focus on enforcement. Mandatory minimum sentencing and fear-based public education campaigns were part of the new strategy. But by the end of 2016, the government had taken actions to return harm reduction to federal policy and since then, harm reduction has become an integral part of Canada's approach to addiction and substance abuse. Harm reduction has expanded to include initiatives like safe injection sites, opioid substitution therapy, naloxone distribution programs, and other more interventions. These efforts aim to minimize the negative consequences of drug use and improve the health and well-being of individuals. Welcome back to A Sound Constitution here on CHLY 101.7 FM. Now, my co-host Laura will discuss some statistics regarding deaths due to illicit drug toxicity here in BC. According to a recent press release from our provincial government regarding the most recent statistics in British Columbia regarding deaths attributed to illicit drug toxicity since the public health emergency was declared, Back in April of 2016, at least 11,171 people have died. And it is very likely the final number for 2022 will uh, almost certainly increase as investigations uh, are completed and the final causes of death are established. Our chief coroner, uh, Lisa Lapointe, recently stated during a press conference, uh, and I quote, 
the reality is that these deaths are preventable. Toxicology data confirms that the drug supply in British Columbia is increasingly volatile and life-threatening. The Standing Committee on Health and two British Columbia Coroner's Service death review panels both agree that we must rapidly increase access to a safer supply of substances, while at the same time building out a robust system of evidence-based care. Those dying are our family members, neighbours, friends, and colleagues. Urgent action is required to reduce the significant risks that tens of thousands of British Columbians are currently facing. A coroner's report, uh, BC coroner's report that was recently uh, published, provided analysis of post-mortem toxicology results um, that thankfully show no indication uh, that prescribed safe supply uh, that is accessible at this point um, is contributing to illicit drug deaths regionally or provincially. So that is um, good news in a sea of, of challenge and, um, and difficulty in, uh, regarding this topic. And um, just to elaborate here, the uh, the most drug toxicity deaths or illicit drug toxicity deaths in 2022 were recorded in Vancouver, Surrey, and Greater Victoria. Um, and in terms of uh, measuring by health authority in 2022, the highest number of illicit drug toxicity deaths were in the Fraser and Vancouver Coastal Health Authorities, um, 680 and 637 deaths, respectively, making up about 58% of all such deaths uh, during that year. It has also <clears throat> been noted that our province has experienced 189 deaths per month in 2022, which averages out to 6.2% lives lost each and every day here in British Columbia. Thank you for that important information, Laura. Now I would like to introduce our guest on the show today, Janice Michelli, who is a counselor here in Nanaimo. Thank you for being on the show with us today. Can you tell us a little bit about your background in counseling and uh, what inspired you to go into that field? Oh, that's a really good question, Sophia. I have always been wanting to be in the helping profession. I even started, I can remember as a little kid and girl guides, <laughs> doing helping at uh, different homes and places where people needed extra help. So once I you know, got older and uh, decided I really wanted to do certain jobs that I needed required schooling. So started my degree here at um, Vancouver Island University. And then I went to University of Seattle to get my master's in counseling. Thanks for telling us a little bit about your background. I'm just going to start by asking a first question today. Um, I just have a question about the stigma around addiction. I know that there's quite a bit of stigma right now, and stigma really is makes it hard for people to ask for help. Um, do you know why there is so much stigma around addiction specifically, and some things we can do to decrease the stigma and encourage people to reach out for help when they need it? Yeah, that's a really tough one because as we all know, um, the services are not up to the demand that's needed. And I know that as, as, as a helper, as a counselor, I have tried to get people into different um addiction services and there's there's quite a wait list there's quite a i mean it's they're they're trying they're coming around and it's not there's just not enough of what people need so stigma is really to me it's about fear people having a fear that they're gonna or someone they love and care for is gonna go down that path but i think it's getting better because people are more, we're hearing more about it. I mean, 20 years ago, I would never have heard things like I do today about stigma and people coming forward and there is more health and disability and things like that. Um, 
But when it comes to addiction, um, and if we're talking, there's all sorts of kinds of addiction, but I, I think you're talking about more to do with drugs and alcohol. Am I correct? Addiction can encompass quite a bit of uh, things. So it can encompass, like you said, substance uses, so drugs and alcohol. Yeah. But there's also sometimes there can be behavioral addictions. Yeah, absolutely. For me and my work, I look at any kind of addiction as a way, of, like a symptom, symptom of a bigger thing. Why, what do I mean by that? I mean that we do things, humans do things in order to alleviate emotional pain, physical pain. Um, and so I, when I work with people, and obviously a lot of, I'm not an actual addictions counselor, but obviously that's a very big part of my work. I don't spend a lot of time talking to them about addiction. Um, that's not all, always, that's not actually my forte either, but to me, it is not, it, to stick with just talking about the addiction creates more um, guilt for people. Nobody wants to be an, an, an addict, in an addiction. Nobody, you know, and the, the drug addiction, the reason I went to that, particularly on alcohol and drugs, is that the changes in the brain um, are very huge and creates yet another huge problem. You know, I, I, I don't look at individuals as the problem within them. So since we're talking about kind of uh, the effect that our lives have on our development of developing addictions, I'll move on to um, something that I found interesting. I was looking at some studies and a lot of studies show that my like Generation Z is the loneliest generation so far. And some experts even say we're experiencing a sort of loneliness epidemic. And Johan Hari, who's a journalist who has extensively researched addiction, uh, he states that the opposite of addiction is connection. And I was wondering what you thought about that statement. You know, I, I realized quite a while ago that we're globally in a really, really sad kind of place, you know? When I was when I was young, we didn't have the information from around the world like now we're inundated by it so much. I think that um, I believe that the younger generations struggle with having uh, dreams about the future. You know, like even moving out. You know, people can't even afford to move out of their parents' place. So there's been a whole changes that goes on. But I do think that connection, like I knew actually in the, I remember when the uh, Britain part put in a portfolio called loneliness in their parliament. So somebody holds that portfolio. Yeah. You know, we, as the world has gotten more advanced, we've forgotten how to actually connect human beings to human beings without social media. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And some people say that, well, aren't we more connected than ever with social media? But it's like, yes, sort of in a way, but social media is is not the kind of connection that humans are meant to have, right? We're meant to have face-to-face -face connections, talking. Well, community. People aren't yeah. having community anymore. Yeah. Um, even in, you know, I think about even Nanaimo and in my area on Hammond Bay there, I, I think about we need to have more kind of smaller centers where people go and gather and have a coffee and meet each other. And, you know, we sure we have Tim Hortons and we have, you know, Starbucks and things like that, but we don't seem to have sort of a place where people can just be. We, when it comes to you, there is, there is really nothing that a lot of, there's nothing to do. I mean, Woodgrove Mall must go berserk because that's that is where everybody hangs out because it's available and it's inside and you know. 
loneliness is probably the worst thing we can do to anybody. We are social animals. We need our community. We need our people. And the other thing I think about for Canada is we're a pretty new country. So as my family and many families, they immigrated here to Canada and left their family behind. So that created yet another source of, of not being with community, not being family, and having to be on your own. And I think after many years of people having to rely on just their immediate family has created yet another issue around loneliness. Having the support from friends and family is super important. Absolutely. I was curious in your own practice, um, when you're talking with clients, you talk about a lot of difficult topics like addiction or sexual abuse. Can you tell me a little bit about the kind of approach that you use with clients when talking with them? Mm -hmm. I don't spend a lot of time talking about their addictions. Uh, I'm going to pick that first because it's different for the second half of the question. Um, so I'm just going to deal with the first half. It is, um, I don't know, I, I, also, I also have to remind, to, I need to point, point out as well, we cannot assume that everybody is the same, right? So everybody's needs are different. Everybody um, has a different way of wanting to open up. Um, but when I when I I find that if we talk a lot about about their addictions, it creates I don't know, it just seems to feel like it brings them down, you know? What is it I can say? What what can you possibly say to somebody that's, you know, they're trying so hard. They've had no jobs, employment is crazy. Um Nobody can live on one job. Nobody, you know, yeah. and especially the major people in our society, um, who I think we should all have gratitude for, are our frontline workers, like at restaurants and coffee shops and, you know, the mall and, you know, all these people that are very underpaid. And they're, they're what's, what's making our country run, really, right? So, Imagine if all those people weren't there. You know, we would all have a panic attack if Tim Hortons closed down. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, you know, there's just a lot of things around that. When it comes to sexual abuse, though, I just want to say, and I'll say this very quickly, it's not, uh, I always tell kids, and I work with teens and children um, who have been sexual abused, and I always tell them right away, they never have to tell me what happened. So going back to the um, example around addiction, mm -hmm. when we ask people to repeat what happened to them, the thought used to be that it would be kind of like, you know, you repeat it so much time, it kind of loses power or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand that concept in other things, but when it comes to sexual abuse, which is the most, horrific thing that can happen to anybody, to a person, in our personal places. Um, to repeat it is causing them more trauma. Yeah. Does that say that I never know what happens? No, that's not what it says. As time goes on and the person is feeling safe with me and trusts me, they, they often do let out a lot of the information, but that's on their autonomy. Mm -hmm. That's not me asking. And that's different. Yeah. So you're really just providing a space for someone to, to talk if they want and kind of meet them where they're at in that moment. Hi, everyone. We're just going to pause the interview for a quick moment and take a short break. We'll be right back. Do you know that mental health problems have a correlation to addictions or substance abuse? Yep, 
Mental illnesses are one of the biggest factors of addictions. Therefore, it is also crucial to recognize that taking care of our mental health plays a significant role in preventing and managing addictions. Here are some tips to help you maintain good mental well-being. Tip number one, build a support system. Surround yourself with a supportive network of friends, family, or professionals who can provide emotional support and understanding. You may feel better if you are able to openly share what you are going through with someone who cares about you. Tip number two, prioritize self-care and have fun. Engage in activities that promote self-care and relaxation. Think of hobbies or activities that bring you joy and give yourself time to do these activities. Tip number three, take care of your physical health. Exercising is a great way to release tension and negative emotions even if it means walking for a few minutes a day. Many studies have shown that keeping physically active can improve your mental health. Tip number four, develop healthy coping mechanisms to manage stress effectively. This can include practicing techniques like deep breathing exercises, meditation and mindfulness, journaling, or engaging in activities that help you relax and unwind. Tip number five, seek professional help. If you're experiencing persistent feelings of anxiety, depression, or other mental health challenges, don't hesitate to seek professional help. A mental health professional can provide guidance, therapy, and support tailored to your specific needs. Remember, everyone's journey is unique and it's important to tailor these tips to your specific circumstances. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction or mental health issues, reach out to a healthcare professional for further assistance. Thank you for joining us here on CHLY 101.7 FM. This is a sound constitution, and if you're just joining us, we're talking to Janice Michelli, a counselor here in Nanaimo, about addictions. Okay, and thank you for answering that question, uh, Janice. I was wondering, um, addiction is all around us, and sometimes it can affect the people we love the most. Do you, is there anything that you can recognize when someone is struggling with addiction and if you can try and help them, are there signs that you can, early signs that you might be able to notice? Yes. I mean, there is, there's some, you know, things like changes of friends, um, behavior that isn't like them, anger, things going missing, money going missing, you know, all the things that you could imagine, right? It's a really difficult thing to do though. Like I, I'm more like I'm thinking right now about in my own family. I don't think there's a family that isn't touched by some kind of addiction. It's really t- tough because of course the person, the young person or anybody in your family is working very hard not to let anyone know. And of course the thoughts are, I'll just do it one more time. When my own family, I had, um, you know, I've had a few people in our family who have struggled a lot. I think one of the things we need to think about is not uh, using shame. shame. Shaming somebody else, being critical on someone else is never helpful. I cannot think of one time in my life it's been helpful. It might be helpful for the, for the the loved one who wants to help them because they don't know what to do. It's such a horrible position. This is a whole different world now because of the poisoning. This is a whole different world. We've seen teens very first time trying um, laced marijuana or, you know, it just, it breaks my heart. When it comes to substances, you know, people have always used them. I mean, I grew up with Rolling Stones, Mother's Little Helper. You know, I mean, whether it's pharmaceutical, which seems to be more acceptable to people, right? People don't seem to freak out when people are using pharmaceutical stuff, but which is also used in ways that are causing addiction as well. I think for me, the biggest thing I wanted to say today is if we look at the person as the problem, then we're really missing out. This is multi-layered. We have generational trauma. I work with First Nations Health Authority, and I'm grateful that 
because I am a white person, particularly, or a non-Aboriginal person, it's the effects of what happened in colonialism is so incredibly strong today. And I am amazed at how many people who are young adults that really don't know anything. And they'll, they'll have people who have been in residential school, um, but they don't talk about it. This is exactly going back to sexual abuse. The shame and the re-traumatizing that happens when people repeat the stories of their trauma is massive. And people like my dad was in the war, World War II for five years, two years after peacekeeping. You know, he was in the trenches. You know, he saw and was involved in, I can't even think what would happen. He's never told us stories ever that were just funny. I have no idea if my dad killed, used his gun and killed, so I don't know. And the reason is, is because it re-traumatizes, right? The other thing is counseling is so important because you're not talking to someone who loves you and cares about you, is an emotional attachment to you. They can talk to us, they can tell us things that aren't something other people would say, you know, or, you know what I mean? Like, it's more freedom. You just feel more comfortable. But a lot of the trauma that people have had is so incredible. And it's not about them. So that's why I say, you know, looking at a person as the individual has the issue, it's way bigger than that. Yes. And we yes. see in our community, it's just massive all over the place. You just have to go downtown and you just... You know, I just, I just shake, I don't shake my head at the people. I shake my head at the people who have the power to make changes. And I know it's multi-layered and I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not really into politics all that much myself. But I think people, when we talk about stigma, which was your first question. Yes. We need to look at people as a way bigger picture. Does that make sense to you? That makes sense to me. I mean, there's a lot of factors playing into, like like you said, you have to consider people's background, where they came from, what trauma they've experienced, the connection they have with, with their families, right? I'm lucky enough that I grew up with two parents and healthy family, but a lot of people don't have that. And that's really important, especially when you're you're a kid, to the de development of a healthy brain. And, and, and have food in your tummy. Yes. And clothes that fit into what other kids are wearing in your age group, you know, being part of it. Sports. I mean, sports is one thing that I would love to see do way more home team kind of ones than than um than more the rep team type of style, which is incredibly expensive. Like unbelievable expensive. Depending on which sport, of course, but I did put my kids in, in all those uh, upper level uh, teams, but I look back now and I'm not taking away our experiences, which were fantastic, but at the same time, it wasn't really necessary. You know, home, like playing house league is uh, fantastic. It's about, you know, what is it you want? I want kids out there. I want them to be active. I want them to meet people. I want them to have fun. Mm -hmm. I would love, I see they have uh, flag football and I thought that was excellent, you know, so more things that kids can just join or more things like, uh, I believe the adult soccer teams have, um, you know, whoever shows up, they break up the teams, right? They just, it's not like you're always on the same team, right? Like things like that, the kids can just do and be with kids and have fun. Mm -hmm. Be a kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be a kid. Okay. So I have my last question for you today. So I, I've been, I read on the uh, Canadian Mental Health Association's website uh, that anxiety is the most common illness right now to affect children and youth. So I was wondering, you mentioned earlier that you do work with the youth population. Do you find anxiety to often be common with the clients you work with or with the youth you work with in particular? Anxiety is not always bad. 
if I didn't have some source of anxiety, I might not look after myself so well, you know, um, watching, you know, when you cross the street. I mean, there's always the anxiety, I think, for me. Um, and I've always struggled with my anxiety, but it, I've kind of made it a bit of a friend. I'm not saying I don't have bad days. I do. Right now, I'm not having one. It's really hard to know what that feels like when you're in the bad, that bad place where you just feel like you're, you know, in a hole and you just want to close the hole off. Um, it, it it also empowered me to probably go to school. That's how I think of it. I wanted uh, my four daughters to have an open sort of pathway to university. And one of the ways we do that is to see family members doing that. So that's one reason I went to school. Um, so my anxiety is actually part of pushing that. I'll never forget driving up to see the advisor at VIU. And when I first started, and I felt like I had that, you know, good guy and evil guy on the other shoulder. And it was like, what are you doing going up there? You don't know how to do school. You're stupid, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then the other person's going, no, no, just go up there and put your name down. Don't listen to him, right? It's exactly what happened to me. Um, anxiety is a very big word in our community. Um, and it is a big problem as well. So as much as it has a good side, the not good side is people find like social phobia, talking about loneliness again, social, like people who just find it hard to leave their place. Pandemic is certainly a big one for that. So yes, anxiety is a big deal, but what is anxiety, you know? I mean, partially it's around feeling unsafe, insecure about our world, about us, and how we're going to manage it. You know, and, and I, I want to touch on, because I think that it's important, we have MADE, which is, um, I can't remember what the acronym is. Medical Assistance in Dying is the acronym. The Medical Assistance in Dying program. We just recently had where it's been encouraged a lot to include mental health. Are you aware of that? Yes, I am aware of that. Yeah. And so I don't think it's struck down. I think it's, I think it's, I don't really know. I'm sorry. I'm not very good on politics, but it's a very difficult subject in so many ways. But then, you know, we have amazing amount of people who are, who are ending their lives. It's high, high, high. And a lot of that, is people just, I don't know, they just, for, for whatever reason, they just can't seem to shake off these horrible feelings they have. And so they commit suicide. And I don't know, um, I'm not a very big religious person, but um, that is very negative in so many ways around religion. It's also considered to be in some people, I do not feel this way, but feel like it's um, selfish. I look at it as a desperate need for peace. And so I'm hoping that they open up the conversations and I'm sure they are. There's great people working hard to get this passed because it, it is, it, it's never really been considered um, as big as cancer. Right? No. Like we have we have cancer funding and uh fundraising like crazy, which I'm not saying that's not a good thing. Of course it's a great thing. But when it comes to mental health, it's not. It's, it's just very odd. It is odd, but um I think like you earlier in the conversation we were mentioning that people do talk about mental health a lot more than they used to. And I think that's that's also in the healthcare true in the healthcare field as well. So I think that'll be the job of, of me and the future nurses in my program to advocate for, for funding around mental health and better policy so we can support people better. Well, thank you for answering all the questions today. You did a great job. I think we'll really benefit from all your knowledge. Thanks for being on the show with us today, Janice. Thank you. 
Thank you for tuning in to CHLY 101.7 FM. This is a sound constitution. And for our final segment today, my co-host Stella will be talking about adverse childhood experiences and their connection to addiction. First, I wanted to talk about what adverse childhood experiences, or as they're commonly called, ACEs, truly are. The United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention defines it as potentially traumatic events that occur in childhood, such as emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, growing up in environments with mental health or substance use problems, and parental separation or divorce. These traumatic experiences can affect how someone regulates emotions, causing the inability to cope in healthy ways. The way it affects our bodies can be described as toxic stress, which is the excessive use of the body's stress response system that can lead to long-lasting effects on the body and mind. Nadine Harris is a pediatrician who speaks about how ACEs can have lasting effects in her TED Talk. We're going to play a short clip from that now to explain toxic stress and the effects it has in more detail. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study is something that everybody needs to know about. It was done by Dr. Vince Felitti at Kaiser and Dr. Bob Onda at the CDC. And together, they asked 17 and a half thousand adults about their history of exposure to what they called adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. Those include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, parental mental illness, substance dependence, incarceration, parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. For every yes, you would get a point on your ACE score. And then what they did was they correlated these ACE scores against health outcomes. What they found was striking. Two things. Number one, ACEs are incredibly common. 67% of the population had at least one ACE. And 12.6%, one in eight, had four or more ACEs. The second thing that they found was that there was a dose-response relationship between ACEs and health outcomes. The higher your ACE score, the worse your health outcomes. For a person with an ACE score of four or more, their relative risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease was two and a half times that of someone with an ACE score of zero. For hepatitis, it was also two and a half times. For depression, it was four and a half times. For suicidality, it was 12 times. A person with an ACE score of seven or more had triple the lifetime risk of lung cancer and three and a half times the risk of ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in the United States of America. Well, of course, this makes sense. You know, some people looked at this data and they said, come on. You know, you have a rough childhood, you're more likely to drink and smoke and do all these things that are going to ruin your health. This isn't science. This is just bad behavior. It turns out this is exactly where the science comes in. We now understand better than we ever have before how exposure to early adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. It affects areas like the nucleus accumbens, the pleasure and reward center of the brain that is implicated in substance dependence. It inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which is necessary for impulse control and executive function, a critical area for learning. And on MRI scans, we see measurable differences in the amygdala, the brain's fear response center. So there are real neurologic reasons why folks exposed to high doses of adversity are more likely to engage in high-risk behavior. And that's important to know. So why is this important to know? Well, it gives us a deeper insight into why people may be dealing with addiction. As we heard in the clip, due to ACEs, many people end up overusing their stress response system, causing toxic stress. This means that the body would get used to that stress and no longer provide a healthy reaction. As these traumatic events are occurring as their brain is still developing, it can cause lasting damage to the brain. Specifically, 
there are measurable differences in the prefrontal cortex and nucleus accumbens that can affect things such as pleasure and impulse control. This means that later on in your life, your body will react differently to things such as stress, pleasure, and impulse control. When the stress response isn't working properly, it also will affect adrenaline release in the body. Adrenaline is released during the stress response and can feel like nervousness or anxiety, but can also feel like excitement. So when your brain is no longer getting signals to start the stress response, people can have trouble with the feelings of excitement or pleasure. This can lead to self-medicating with substances to find that feeling that they have been missing due to toxic stress. As well, due to low impulse control, substances may not seem like such a bad option, which can lead to addiction very fast. In a study conducted in Sweden, they found that 90% of the studied population that used substances had at least one ace in their life. And the conclusion of the study found that people who have aces have twice the risk of developing substance use disorder in their lifetime. This is relevant as the number of people who are experiencing aces is only growing. From the mid 90s, which is when the original study, the TED Talk mentioned, to the study done in 2012 in Philadelphia, there was a 13.3 increase in the amount of people who have experienced adversity in childhood. And with that, I'm wrapping up today's episode. I would like to thank Janice Michelli for sitting down with a sound constitution and sharing her knowledge about addiction in her work as a counselor. I would also like to thank our audience for tuning in, as well as my co-hosts Lara, Shan, and Stella for their contributions in this episode about addiction. For details and show notes from today's episode, or to follow along in what's coming up this season. Check out our Facebook page, A Sound Constitution, our Instagram, C H O Y, A Sound Constitution, all one word, or our Twitter at A C underscore V I U. If you've missed parts of this episode or would like to listen to more episodes, check out our YouTube at A Sound Constitution. Otherwise, we will see you all next week.